Comic Corner. My name is Damon. I'm your host. And what we do here is comic book news, reviews, and interviews. Today we have the full squad. All three of us have assembled, starting out with AF, buddy. It's been a hot minute. How you doing? Dude, I'm I'm doing so, so good. We are a week away from New York Comic Con. I am under a week away from seeing you live yes. in the flesh. In and the flesh. I cannot wait to start talking comics today. In the flesh, it's going to be magical. It's going to be great. We have a fantastic show today because, yes, there is a little book that came out this week. Uh, we will talk about that. But first, TJ, Fat Thor, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody watching and listening in today. It's fantastic to see you. And... I'm doing I'm doing great, man. You could say thriving even. I touched some grass this morning. I saw some birds. So ten out ten out of ten recommend. Everyone go touch some grass today. But after you finish this show here. Yes. After you finish the show. Or if you're listening to us on podcast form, keep touching grass. That's always a good recommendation. Let's start with the rundown, shall we? Because yes, as we mentioned. There's a little book that came out this week. I don't know if you guys heard. Um, a thing called Absolute Batman. Batman, I think that is correct. Yes, we will be talking about Absolute Batman. And Bat how did that book live up to the hype or did it not? We will see. I haven't asked these two their thoughts yet on it, so that should be interesting. But that's not the only book that came out this week because this is a full week of comics. Ultimate Hawkeye is here. And look, if you don't know me, Hawkeye is my guy, my gal. I am excited for a brand new Hawkeye. We will talk about this Hawkeye. And puckle up, losers. Because Minor Arcana number two dropped. And it's a trip. It is a wild, wild trip. But as I mentioned, we do news reviews and interviews. So that means we got some news to talk about. I'm kind of throwing you guys into the woods here on this one. I don't know if you saw this, but this came out, this came out the other day. And look, I don't love using scoops in the show, but this one was too big not to talk about. Uh, if you've been enjoying Chip Zdarsky's Batman, great. I think it's been fun. The failsafe arc was a lot of fun. Uh, but here's a scoop from Bleeding Cool from Rich Johnston. Uh, we got a couple, couple little names possibly joining this book next little year. Names. Little names. Uh, Jim Lee and Jeff Loeb, I think they are. Yeah. Um, wow. Talk about a 2000s flash in the pan. Like, let's stir something up here. I, I know neither of you have really been digging deep into the current Batman run. So my first question is this for you, AF. Would putting Jim Lee and Jeff Loeb on a Batman book reignite your interest in reading it absolutely like i i'm always looking for new takes on these characters and we're going to get into that with absolute batman personally um mm -hmm. but I, i'm like jim lee i mean the guy is a genius he is uh, a pillar over at dc comics so i trust him with every single thing moving forward and yeah i'm, I'm definitely going to check this one out when it drops next year Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's if this is true as well. You know, this is just a report. This is just a scoop. Uh, I will push back and almost say, TJ, this this isn't the first time we've seen Jeff Loeb or Jim Lee on a Batman book. So when AF said we are asking for a new take, I don't know. Do you think we'll actually get like a brand new take here or will there just be more of like a nostalgia fest? I feel like I'm leaning towards nostalgia fest especially since we're going so i don't want to say crazy but absolute batman is like such a new and fresh take i feel like anything they could come with unfortunately would just fall short at least in my opinion because i i personally just think the the concept of absolute batman is everything that you were just talking about and i'll also say you know i won't don't have to go down a whole tangent on this but for me personally, Jim Lee, two thumbs up. Love the guy, everything he does. But Jeff Loeb, not nah, I 
not my not my dude. Don't like him. Uh, said some things that were really uncool, and mm-hmm. so uh, for me, I probably won't be picking this up because of that. And you know, that's unfortunate. But yeah, that's kind of again. I don't want to go on a whole tangent on that, but yeah, mm-hmm. that's how I feel. But Jim Lee, like AF said, he's incredible. So that's exciting. But yeah, I agree with you, Damon. It sounds kind of like it'll be more of a nostalgia for like, hey, remember you like this, so you'll mm-hmm. like this. That's fine. We talk about that. I love that kind of stuff usually. But yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a no for me, Cotton. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the the only reason why I I think it could be something new or it could be something different. I wouldn't say new. I would say something different. And I mean, over the years, we get a gazillion Batman titles every single year, a gazillion different types of Batman stories. So maybe Jim Lee just gives us something different, something maybe not new, but it's not going to be your run-of-the-mill Batman story. Yeah, maybe. My my big takeaway is this. When it comes to Batman in particular, I just kind of always want big swings with Batman, right? Batman's a character that's been done for so long. We've pretty much done almost everything we could possibly do with Batman. I mean, for crying out loud, we just had Batman jump off the moon in Chip Zdarsky's run, right? Like, we've done a lot with Batman. So my whole thing with Batman, outside before we go into this absolute book, is it's like... Is it almost time for Bruce to hang it up and just give it to Damien at this point or really train him to properly be Batman at this point? Because he's done, like, I fear we've done everything we could. Now, that's why I'm saying with you bring in all brand new, young, fresh, creative team. I know they keep trying to go for big names. And yeah, when you put big names on a Batman book, that's always going to draw interest, whether it's James Tynion, whether it's Scott Snyder, whether it's Chip Zdarsky, right? Your Batman books are always going to sell. I want to swing with Batman unless if you're not going to like completely push him forward to that next stage in his life. But this is what we're here for. This is what this is the big talk of the week. This is the big talk of the year. I haven't seen this much excitement over a book since about a year ago today ish when Ultimate Spider Man came out. This is absolute Batman. This is from Scott Snyder. This is from Nick Dragata. This is the first book in this absolute universe outside of that all-in special that we got last week. That was more of a setup to everything. It was a prelude. And golly, guys, does this book hit hard? Is this a great first issue? Because I really think so. When you, It's kind of funny because I won't beat around the bush when it comes to the comparisons right if you like the ultimate universe that marvel's doing right now specifically that ultimate spider-man book if you're enjoying that you're gonna love this like i think you're really going to love this because it takes that idea of the familiar but with a such a refreshing take you almost in both of them you take away at least in this absolute world you take away the thing that gives them the advantage you take away the thing that gives bruce the advantage which in this case it's his wealth it's his money you take that away and how does a middle to maybe lower class batman a working class batman a working class bruce wayne become batman how does he do that and we get that in this book. So before we go into spoilers, because we will be talking about spoilers, we kind of have to. But before we dive into that, I just want your first impressions from reading this AFU first. Dude, I I liked it. Like I just said now, we, we, we look for new and fresh takes on all of these characters. And every single page I went through, it was something that I didn't expect. All the reveals were amazing. The, the twists were good. And um, yeah, I, I'm resonating so much with this Bruce Wayne because he has to work just like we do. He has to work just as hard as we do. And I love that. I, I cannot wait to see where the story goes, but we're going to get into spoilers in a bit. TJ, what do you think? I hated it. It was awful. <laughs> I'm just joking. It was fan. It was awesome, dude. It was so so good. Uh, and uh, we've talked about this before, but we got a big beefcake Batman 
meaning he's actually made of beef, which is a real big swing for Snyder, I thought. But no, in all seriousness, great book. It was, I love this concept so, so much. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit on Penguin, which is kind of dealing with similar themes. And I have always felt that one of the most interesting and things that make Gotham and Batman so interesting and kind of feel real is the class disparity that is on display, whether that's in, you know, the lower class of Gotham versus the higher class, like Maroney's and the Waynes and all that. So I really love how we're focusing on that. And like you said, this Batman, he never grew up with money. And it's like such a concept that sounds so simple. It's like, how has no one thought of this before, right? Like we've seen broke Batman. We've seen Bruce Wayne like lose his money, but it's a completely different dynamic for someone who has grown grown up with money and someone who hasn't. And like that perspective on life is like night and day. So like, it's not just this Bruce Wayne doesn't have money. It's that he's never had money. So his perspective on what Gotham is, what the underworld of Gotham is, is just completely flipped around. So that is so interesting to me. I think like the concept alone is great. And then this issue just sold it perfectly. Like we get action, we get a little bit of backstory, not enough to like, you know, we're still questioning exactly everything that went on. But yeah, I mean, you know, shout out Scott Snyder killed it. Nick Tricotta's art in here is superb. It's not phenomenal. I'll say this. If you're trying to go into this as spoiler-free as possible, move on to the next book now in our chapter system because we're about to dive head first into it. And let's not uh, wait any longer. We get a very cool Alfred to start off this book. And I have some theories about this Alfred uh, personally, but AF, when you first saw like, we're getting spy Alfred here. We're getting some sort of secret agent alfred who's rugged has a kid like this, this is a this is a cool alfred dude i i enjoyed that reveal because so when i did comics i tend to read it in the person who i think is speaking in their voice um and i was just like i didn't expect that at all i was mm -hmm. just like oh okay that's that's a nice little twist over there. And I don't know if you guys ever watched the TV show Pennyworth. Pennyworth, yeah. And this Alfred feels very similar to the Alfred that was in that show. Uh, just a more grown-up version. It seems like this Al Alfred is going to be just as brutal. He's going to be uh, just as street smart. And yeah, I'm... I'm excited to see where this goes for him because it's a different Alfred. It's a different it's take. Very different and Alfred. Give, give, give me more of him. <laughs> I want to see more of this. I want to see more brutality. And I just want to see this Alfred go completely bonkers. So I have a theory with this Alfred TJ. I teased it to you last night when we were doing our Agatha all along live reaction, which by the way, thank you to everyone who tuned into that and has been continuously watching the replay of that. It's been superb for us. And if you are watching us as well, thank you for watching us. Here's my theory, buddy. You ready for this? Because we still don't know exactly who Alfred is working for yet. And this is my big brain. Let's go nuts. You want to get nuts? Let's go nuts. What if this Alfred is working for the absolute Court of Owls? Ooh. It's a theory. It's we a don't theory. know we don't know anything. I like it's, that theory. It's out there. I I was thinking that this Alfred is just going to be a mercenary. Mm -hmm. The dude is just gonna be a He's clearly a working for someone. Fire. Yeah, he's clearly working for someone. Don't yeah. know who yet. I like that theory a lot. The only thing I would say to go, like keep us questioning, right, mm -hmm. is so in the beginning, he talks about like how he hasn't been to Gotham in a while, right? Like, so he's been, that's you know, true. out on adventures. Yeah, so true. my my only pushback on that theory was if mm -hmm. he's working for the Quarter Owls, I would imagine they would keep him in Gotham. Almost as that's like true. their their owl or whatever that dude's name is. Talon, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing, but I still love it. I think, like you said, he's obviously working for somebody. And it that's seems true. to me that that somebody 
isn't entirely good, right? I wouldn't necessarily say like a villain or like a bad guy. We don't know yet, but definitely not like a super cool dude or or woman. We don't know. It was just a hologram. But I I love this new Alfred though. I I didn't watch Pennyworth and like most of my knowledge of like Alfred's old life as like a spy and all that stuff like very limited. So I just love like going all in on that take. Like, nah, he's not a butler. Like, he's just like, I mean, I think it feels like similar to how they're doing Bruce. Like, again, Alfred, uh, yeah, he has like the military background, but if he becomes a butler with like high society and he's around these people, but this Alfred has never been that. He's always been this mercenary or, you know, spy, whatever he is. So again, I'm really interested to see how the two dynamics between the two characters work and just how, again, how Alfred sees this world, his outlook on Gotham, because it's going to be, again, completely shift around. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's just talk about the big man himself real quick before we move into our other books, because we have a lot of other books to talk about. Man, this has got to be the coolest version of Bruce Wayne. This has got to be. This has got to be the Easy. like the coolest version of Bruce we could possibly get. We get a cool little panel where we see a guy working on like you know a punching bag in a gym, and you think it's Bruce at first, and they do the bait and switch because then he comes as beefcake behind him, <laughs> and we have you know Jim Dude, is the yep. mayor. Yeah, Jim is the mayor of this. We have some stuff going on with the Maronis and the Falcons. We have a new power entering Gotham. And then we get a big fight at the City Hall. Quick shout out in here. Really funny moment that I can't tell you. When was the last time we got a thwip in a Batman comic? Because the very first time we see him use like this new suit, you get a little thwip very spider-man like because then the next time we see him batman's upside down telling everyone in the city hall to stay put while he does his work now let's also talk about one big thing here real quick and that's a big thing on his chest everyone was making fun teasing poking at this strange bat symbol that is just a big honking rectangle and we're like, what the heck is this? What is the point of this? Well, the cool thing about this suit is that everything has a use. Everything has a meaning behind it. And when he takes out this rod and puts it on his chest, and then off comes that plate that becomes a battle axe. That was so dope. Peak that was books. That was so good. So, so great. Like when, when I saw yeah. that, when I saw that, and I mean the dude that he was going up against, another yoke guy. I mean, it was a a battle of giants over there. But I mean, <laughs> before that dude could finish his sentence, his arm was gone. Like <laughs> that, he he moves so fast. This Batman is so big, but he's so fast. I mean, he has it all. This absolute Batman is absolute. He is I absolutely honestly huge. wish. I honestly wish I didn't see that page in the preview. So, like, they released that, oh, that uh, page in previews, and uh, it still hit. It still hit. But I was just thinking, like, man, imagine if I didn't see this before and I just, like, discovered that, like, oh, that would have hit so good. But, yeah, I the symbol thing is so freaking cool. And I love... To me, and I, people feel different. You ask 10 people, you'll get t 10 different opinions, right? But I, I'm a very firm believer in the no-kill rule for Batman. Like, yes, I stand on that. I was just that. about to get into that. But what I love, I also love, though, I love a brutal Batman, right? Which, I mean, might sound bad, but, like, he's not going to kill you, but, like, you might not walk afterwards, right? And this totally gave me that. And I, I want to shout out really quickly our friends over at Nerd Initiative. They just talked to Scott uh, Snyder the other day, and he was mentioning how in this scene in particular, which they mentioned in the issue, but, like, he's making a yes, show of did. it. Like he's purposely like he purposely breaks people's bones in the place where it will be loudest. And like it's all intimidation. And like, again, he's not going to kill you. And I, I forgot how he put it, but it's like he's not going to kill you. But like you're not going to fucking sorry. Flurkin, forget that. There, sorry, boys. There's our one. I took it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's there's one little narrative bubble in here that's doing a lot of work and it just says they're all still breathing 
and he knows how to hit every spot and avoid the artery. And it's like, yeah, that, that one line of dialogue is doing a lot of lifting because these guys here are just getting slaughtered left and right, but not to the end, just enough to keep them breathing. And that even goes to the very end of this book when he even confronts uh, Alfred at one point in that big fight, he takes Alfred's big lethal gun and turns it into a non-lethal gun. So you get a shocking moment where we see this version of Batman use a gun, but it's a non-lethal because it's still respecting that aspect of him where he won't kill. Now, just yeah. him using the gun in the first place is going to be controversial. But the fact that he... I feel like he did it and he used it just to show that, like, I will take these things away from you and make them useless in your eyes. It's very cool. There's also one last thing before we move on. There's almost a little slogan in this book that you see at the very beginning. It's the very end. And it's when little Bruce is in that bat cave hiding. And you see all these little fun facts about bats. But the first fun fact is just like the title of it all. Bats are crazy. That is almost the underlying theme and slogan of absolute Batman. This man is crazy. Yeah. He is, he's, he's, he's a lunatic. But we get a little epilogue of a man who is traditionally crazy, traditionally a lunatic. And the richest man in Gotham in the absolute universe is a man who doesn't really have a name, but people call him the Joker because he never laughs. Man I love how they just—they just—they just left that cliffhanger, and we are all super interested. We are Yo, so that's curious. That's who Alfred's working for. Oh, mm. yo, richest man in Gotham, right? Has his little what? own personal mercenary. I don't know. That's something. I want to say really quickly too. You mentioned the posters. Uh, another thing Scott Snyder said. Uh, those posters are not like super important, but they give you kind of a preview of what the issue will be, right? And we're going to be seeing more of these posters oh, in each issue. So, I, like I said, I don't, he didn't say like they're like, you know, groundbreaking important, but cool little thing to keep a lookout in future issues. Mm -hmm. One last thing. I keep saying one last thing, but there's so many things in the book. <laughs> that, that is one thing about this book. There's a lot in this book. We should have just so done an absolute wanna... episode. He probably could have. There's a lot in this book. A big thing here, his mother, Martha, still alive because only his dad was at the zoo when the shooting happened and his dad was the one who saved him and all his classmates and his classmates include the traditional Gotham underground scene. So that's also interesting. He has a relationship with who would traditionally be Killer Croc, who's Waylon. You know, he's got a little relationship with him there, like a friendly childhood relationship. So that's interesting. But we see her in that courtroom scene and you don't realize who she is at first. I don't Did either of you pick up on who she was at first? No, TJ. No. Yeah, I didn't no. either until we see her at the end. And there she is with the little white pearls still on her naturally. And then when you go back, because I had to go back, be like, did she? Yep. You've in that very first scene, you see the white pearls yeah. around her neck. So very, very, very clever. I'm interested to see how that whole dynamic with her has changed to wrap Another, this up. Yeah. So go ahead. One, one last thing. One, one last, last thing. thing. <laughs> one last thing. One last thing. Um, like earlier, you mentioned like he's like, he's used to the underworld and like he's, He's seeing things because he's lower to middle class. And the people that he plays poker with, that he does poker night with, is Selena Kyle, Edward Nigma, Oswald Cobblepot, and Harvey Dent. Mm -hmm. Those are all Gotham dogs over there that he's chummy chummy with. So yeah. that will be interesting to see if they are, in fact, all of those supervillains in this universe, uh, or what that sort of relationship will turn out to be moving forward. It's interesting. It is interesting. I think all of us, we highly recommend this book. If you haven't picked up this book yet, go buy it. Go read it. You will love it. If you made it this far, just get it. Just get this it's, book. It's, it's the it's must great. read of the year, no doubt. It sure. is. It is the must read of the year so yep. far. So far. Because we have a lot. Great year for comics. Great year for comics. And that Got includes... two more months. Yep. And that includes a little book 
that I've been enjoying. I'll be very quick on this. This has been Action Comics. This is the first issue of Mark Wade's run that is becoming a weekly run. So I've been going back and forth with Mark Wade. Hopefully we get an interview with him very soon, sometime in November. Fingers crossed. This is solid. It's a, fir- a solid first issue. So essentially, uh, here's a story. Um, something's going on with the Phantom Zone projector. And Superman has to find out. But because Superman's Superman, he knows that things in the beings in the Phantom Zone is becoming restless, it's becoming unruly. And Clark, his inner good guy, his inner Boy Scout, knows that he can't let that happen under his watch. So he's not just going in to fix whatever's going on with the Phantom Zone projector, but he's going in to fix essentially the unruliness that's going on within the Phantom Zone. So that's interesting. There's a backup in here with Supergirl. This is a straight setup issue, like pure setup issue uh, from Mariko Tamarki and uh, Skylar Patridge, where all we know, literally all we know by the end is Supergirl's going on a mission and no one knows what it is. That's the beginning of it. So pretty fun first issue to this weekly run of Action Comics. We'll be keeping up with that as much as possible. Now, a book I've been enjoying, a book I know TJ's also been enjoying, but an issue I've been highly anticipating. We get our very first new Hawkeye since Kate Bishop. Everyone, I would like to introduce you to Charlie. Charlie's the new Hawkeye because in the Ultimate Universe, uh, Clint Barton was offered the role of Hawkeye by future Tony Stark who went back in time and was like, hey, be this. And Clint said, F you, I'm out of here. And he walked away. Charlie here picked it up. And what I love about this first issue is Steve Rogers is off to essentially, he was told by Tony Stark to go retrieve the gear. But Steve Rogers is Steve Rogers, so he just more wants to see does this person deserve the gear? And what I love about Charlie is it honors and pays homage to early Clint Barton, who is not a good person. Clint Barton started off as an Iron Man villain. So I do think it's interesting that the counter, the flip point of this is that this Hawkeye's first villain, his first opponent is Captain America and not Iron Man, even though this Hawkeye also butts heads. You may also notice one thing. We have a male Hawkeye with Clint Barton. We have a female Hawkeye with Kate Bishop. So far, we've been using they, them pronouns for this Hawkeye with Charlie. They haven't really specified at all. And I think that's pretty cool. It's not like in your face about it. It's very subtle about it. We don't know anything other than they are Charlie. And we have some really fun moments between Charlie and Captain America where Charlie says, hey, I deserve this. Do you know what my native name is? Charlie Hawk's Eyes. I was like, oh, that's cool. But by the end, Captain America, Steve Rogers, by the end says, hey, is that true? And he just goes, you white men will believe everything. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the coolest parts about this version of Hawkeye is that Charlie has a 3D printer where their arrows are made. That's clever. Very clever. So Charlie can get any arrowhead that Charlie wants. That's dope. At any given moment. That's super creative. TJ, I know you read this and I just went on a tangent because, hey, I'm a Hawkeye person. I have Hawkeye stuff all around me. But what did you think about this issue? You got it. I mean, I'm a broken record at this point. I loved it. It's The Ultimates has been one of my favorite titles going on. This issue delivered just as much as the other ones. I absolutely love this new Hawkeye. I love that uh, they are native. I feel like that just makes so much sense. And I I love it. I love it. I love everything about it. I want uh, the action in this issue was super good like very fluid very dynamic him and cap like going at it awesome awesome i cannot wait to get more charlie to dive more into 
everything they're about. I want I want a whole Charlie solo. Like, give me the whole give story, me. right? I mean, just one issue. I mean, we don't have to. I hey, let's do a series, right? I'm for it. But even just like a focused issue, I think that would be great. Yeah. But great so introduction the, to the character. Great introduction. By the end, Charlie was going back and forth, Cap being like, you know, you're going to take this away from me. And Cap says, no, I was just making sure that you wouldn't going to miss. And Charlie never missed. There's some really cool, just classic Hawkeye stuff that's come up in the Fraction runs and the Kelly Thompson runs, where whenever Charlie brings out a brand new arrowhead, you get that nice little descriptor of what the arrow hit is next to it, and you get a nice zoom in on it. You get a bunch of that in here. There's some really cool ones, some that we've never seen before, like a traditional indigenous native warhead arrowhead. Very tra like traditional. Something that we haven't seen any Hawkeye do before. Love it. I just want all three of them to team up now. I need my, I need my book just called The Hawkeyes. Give me a whole Hawkeye team. I Green Arrow has Why his the family. Hell not? Green Arrow has his family. Clint Barton is a goddamn mess. Give him his family. Just bring bring Charlie into the main universe at some point and give me the Hawkeyes. That's all I want. That's all I want. All right. The Sentinels. DJ, talk to me about this one. This one was super good. It kind of a sleeper hit for me. I just picked it up because I'm all in on the from the ashes stuff. And it really, I don't want to say surprise me because it's not like I was expecting it to not be good, but I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. It's like kind of a mercenary team going after the, you know, I, I don't think all mutants, but like uh, first issue we deal with Omega Red. So like they're going after Omega Red and it's very kind of, like I said, mercenaries kind of reminds me of aliens, like how like the mercenaries are going out there on this adventure and uh, they're, you know, linked up with Trask. There's like that kind of corporate element to it. And it was really cool. Like I said, it's definitely something different from the other X books. It really, you know, doesn't follow the mutants. It follows people looking for mutants. So yeah, really, really cool. If you guys are, you know, looking for something outside in the X-Men world, but not necessarily like, you know, costumes and all that. I definitely recommend checking this out. Yeah, you know, that's, I mean, yeah, go ahead. F. I was going to say that's that's a, a different point of view for for a mutant com comic book. And over on Threads, um, I don't like Damon. I know you use Threads, TJ. I don't know if you ventured out into that side yet. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of comic book chatter over over on Threads, and there's been a lot of complaints that there's too much. X-Men or mutant centric books. Do you guys yeah, agree with are. that? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's so many mutant books right now, whether they are mini series, whether they're ongoings, we have three or four main just X books. We have X-Men uncanny or three X-Men uncanny and exceptional. And then you just have like all the yeah. other individual spinoff. Just there's about 13 well. there's... titles right now currently Minimum. And that okay. includes yeah, yeah that includes phoenix dazzler sentinels mm -hmm. uh but then like you said you have the main x books like exceptional yeah. x-men uncanny the main x tile nyx so yeah i think it's mm -hmm. a and like we just got storm which is another book we're going to be talking about today so yeah i think it's about 13 total x we're titles two for wolverine the, from the books ashes and, yeah, yeah wolverine i forgot to mention yeah psylocke we're, we're getting a lot it's a lot. So if you're yeah. trying to keep up with every X book, that's not going to be cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's not nope. going to be cheap. That's well, that's why that's we're been... here, though. That's why yeah. we're here, folks, to give you the exactly. insight on the ones 100%. that maybe you didn't pick up. <laughs> Beautiful. Love that. Speaking of books, I haven't been able to pick up yet. This is the annuals. Is this the finale of this... like all the annuals? All right. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Tell me what happens with the Infinity Watch with all my Infinite Destiny characters. So it's crazy, though. Like, I mean, this was the culmination of all of those annuals um, and the Infinity Watch that we've seen that began ages ago, uh, finally culminating into this issue. And all of the Stone Beaters, they basically just got together into one sort of area. Captain Marvel and I 
think it was Thor. Yeah, the two of them were tasked with just like sorting all of this stuff out because we know when it comes to Infinity Stones, who's going to come knocking? It's Thanos. He's going to be there immediately. The moment all of them are assembled in one place, he's going to come knocking. And this time we have a seventh stone, which is the Death Stone. The Death Stone brought, Finally got brought Paul Coulson back to life. Yep. He's alive again. Yes, and yes. he joined them as well um, when Captain Marvel and uh, Thor finally met with the team. All hell just broke loose because a lot of them, they don't like the Avengers and they think the Avengers are there to take the stones and to take their powers and then a whole battle is ensued. Thanos came and we literally in the, those last few pages is probably an R-rated version of what would have happened in Infinity War. Thanos came and just brutally killed every single member of that Infinity Watch. <laughs> like blood spatter the works <laughs> and yeah like one of the one of the members the one that wasn't killed he has the power of the time stone and he managed to jig his way out of that and he brought everybody back to life yeah. and they found a way to <laughs> time travel damon your favorite oh, God. <laughs> never well, mind um, <laughs> that was the first time i was gonna be like get this on camera you ready you ready look at me right and now then... <laughs> Thank God for time travel, because I would have been really mad if they killed Star for good. <laughs> and then um, they managed to take Thanos away. Uh, Coulson joined them as well. Nick Fury didn't want him to, but he knew that he had to. Um, and yeah, that's how that ended. And it leaves it off on going into the Infinity Watch series that drops, I think, in December this year. I think okay. they get their own their own series, oh, nice. and I don't know if it's limited or not. But yeah, the the story carries on uh, into that run. Uh, one funny bit is at the starting of of, of this book, um, you had Tony Stark, Iron Man, uh, trying to get through to them to help them. He's stuck in space somehow with uh, some force field that he can't get through, and he's trying to get through that with Captain America and. Then at the end of it, while everything is done, everything just like finished off, he messages to say, okay, I finally ma managed to get through. Do you guys need us? And then the issue just ends there with dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> mm, no, we don't need you. We don't need you. They do. All right. We brought up Storm earlier. This came out last week. TJ, how was Storm? I mean, do I got to say it? <laughs> it really? was great. It was okay. great. I mean, you know, y'all know I love my lightning powers. So Storm is another one of my favorites, probably one of probably my favorite member of the X-Men. So just to see her get the spotlight, get her own series is just awesome in itself. But I mean, this this was a great first issue. Gives you some backstory on Storm. I think really showcases who she is, not just as a hero, but just as a person. I mean, she's been at, uh, queen of Wakanda, ruler of Araco, Avengers member, obviously a long, long time member of the X-Men. Like, she's been through it. So this, again, to me, this issue really showcased her history, who she is and is like setting us off on this new just storm focused adventure which i think is long long overdue all right there and the cruise hey, is if you're interested. amazing hey, if you're interested you're gonna pick this up when you get it are you talking to me yeah buddy <laughs> um you 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 lagged a bit when you asked that one um Probably not. Uh, I'm trying to uh, keep my bank account in order That's right now. <laughs> um, well, we did just mention that there's 13 Xbox minimum out right fair. now. So. And again, uh, AF. That's why I'm here. Is, I'll just I'll just tell you yeah. about it every week. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But also, this just makes me want to mention again, Marvel, Marvel Unlimited in South Africa. Win. Come oh, on, guys. True. Very very Come true. On. That'd be huge. That'd be huge. Get Marvel Unlimited out there. That way you could read it's Jeff. You can't even read it's Jeff out there. Make him a global sensation. That's all we want. 
It's all we want. It's all Jeff deserves. All right. Your last book of Marvel. We went a little heavy on Marvel this week. AF, Spider Gwen the Ghost Spider. Is that Jessica Jones? That is indeed an, that. an amazing team up. And um, so in, in this issue, we find out that Jessica is the one who saved her after being stabbed on that bridge, falling off, seemingly dying. Um, Jessica is the one that's that pulled out of the out of the the lake and saved her life. And she was done. She did that because Peter asked her to do it uh, as a favor to him. But she's That's been keeping favor. her eye on. Yeah, apparently because, like, not of goodness of her heart. Her. But hey, I, you owe me one. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jessica has been keeping an eye on Gwen um, ever since she arrived on on this earth. Uh, and yeah, she. This was more like a mentorship sort of issue. Um, Gwen kept on asking questions, asking for advice. Um, she's trying. She was trying to decide if she should give up her Gwen persona and just be a ghost, um, because on her earth she was that shining light, but on this earth, Peter and Miles and Silk they they are the shining lights for uh, for for the city. So she needs to like try and find a place. So she tries to go operate in the shadows. She tries to have that hardened exterior. But I'm really glad that they didn't carry on with that because that takes a lot of away from who Gwen is. And I like Gwen Stacy. I like the ghost spider. I like it with her snarky comments and her bubbly personality. So I'm I'm happy that they didn't make her all dark and cold and uh, a beauty person. Uh, but yeah. Stephanie Phillips, home run. I like this interaction. I like this team up. And um, I've noticed that there's a lot of team up so far in this run. Uh, I don't mind it. And I remember in the first issue that I spoke about this, Damon, you were worried about the MCUification with OB being introduced. Yeah. He hasn't come back since, since, since the first episode. And I think it was just about like, Okay, yes, somebody that you know from the MCU, maybe this will draw people in. And she mentions him every, every now and then, but he doesn't make an appearance. So, yeah, I like it. I like the writing. I like the direction that Stephanie goes and the art in this is phenomenal. Every single well, I, issue. I do know there's a TVA book coming out sometime soon. And mobius is in it and miss minutes is in it and it's very mcu of it all but i wouldn't be surprised if spider gwen plays a part in it because of her now relationship with ob keeping yep. an eye on that there all right we're into our indies we're into our indies did either of you get the chance to read minor arcana we have a thumbs up from I tj not. af says no so tj and i will chat about this TJ, I remember when this first issue came out, I was higher on this first issue than you were. And I understood your point with it, which was essentially that first issue was very like settling. It's a slow burn. Not a whole lot happened. But this issue, in my opinion, really gave us what we should expect with this book going forward and the whole plot of it all. We have our main character here, and she's the daughter of a psychic, and she's like, ah, psychicness is stupid, and I'm just going out to, going back home begrudgingly to help my mom, and mm, looks like there's something to the psychicness of it all, because she was drawn into this psychic realm, psychic landscape, and when she's doing a reading for one of her mom's longtime clients, she finds what seems to be her client's now past husband. So TJ, what did you think about this issue? Did this bring you back in? Slow first issue. Now that the second issue is out, I am appreciating the slow burn. I appreciate when writers take their time. It's clear mm. that the writer here has something to say. And again, I feel like some writers can maybe sometimes jump the gun in like getting us into the action and the, all that, which is yeah. great sometimes. But in this book in particular, I'm enjoying them taking their time with it. 
No, I absolutely agree. I mean, Jeff Lemire is a master at this. He's doing the art in here. He's doing the writing. And I love his storytelling. And I think it's phenomenal. I think it's superb. And what I was really interested in is like at the end of this, Teresa does reach out to this and is able to contact and talk to uh, this client's deceased husband. And he's saying, just tell her I'm still at the lake. I'm waiting for her when she gets here. And then, Teresa cry, still, dude. and then dude, Teresa at the end showing that, you know, she still has some growing up to do, or at least some realization of what she's about to be in because she comes back to the land of the living and the client's like, well, did you get anything? She just said, F you, F this, I'm out of here. Yeah, that was <laughs> I didn't so talk to anybody. sad. I, I, like, I, oh. Very quick, because we got to get on to our next book, but that was so sad. I'm I'm a self-proclaimed wife guy, for sure. So, like, <laughs> the whole thing of him, like, waiting for her, oh, man, that was that was so good. It hit it hit real good. Not, not gotcha. good. It hit bad, because I was sad, but good sad. From the beginning of one book... To the end of another. This is Crocodile Black number five, Philip Kenny Johnson's son, and Patricio Opech. Oh man, this this finale, buddy. What a ride this has been. We've been speculating theories about this book on what this whole book kind of means, what it's trying to tell. And at some points I'm thinking, oh, this is a possession. Maybe it is a possession. Maybe it's not a possession. There's a lot of different elements that are going on in this book in particular. My first conclusion with this, so this follows Danny. Danny's just kind of gone off the end. He's gone off the ledge and he is just on a murder spree at this point, going after gangs themselves. They the drug cartels are scared of him because they don't know what he's capable of and Danny doesn't even know what he's capable of at this point I almost understood this before the epilogue my takeaway from this was this was a kid who was prone to stories being put into his head he was just prone and he was more of a sponge type of kid right and when he goes into this house to deliver food and he picks up this war journal and he's taking all this in, he's soaking up the PTSD from war. And I think this is a good commentary on what PTSD can do to people. Because this he just went off the edge. Now, there is an epilogue to this that shows there may be a little something else going on here. But TJ, what would you make of this book? Well, see, this is why I think this book is so great and was so successful with me is I think, especially how it ends, you can kind of, you read your own interpretation of it. So yes. like multiple people can read this and take away something completely different from it. And I think to me, it wrapped up perfectly. We have talked uh, a lot about like our theories of the book and, you know, is it this way or is it that? I don't want to spoil too much of it, but... I thought the way that they ended it again was like ambiguous, but it gave you enough to make a conclusion of what was going on with Danny. And in my opinion, I think you hit it on the head of the PTSD. And to me, this was just a story while, you know, take some crazy turns at the end of the day, it's a story about someone that is struggling like very much struggling, not financially, but just with themselves and trying to uncover what that is. And to me, it's just a very, very deep hitting story. And uh, what's called Phil Kennedy Johnson. He obviously has military background. So I think a lot of that comes through in this, like I said, dealing with things that are hard to deal with and memories and, you know, things of that nature. So, yeah. This book is, it's awesome. Five issues, not, you know, super long read, but it achieves what it sets out to do in those five issues. And it ends perfectly. Obviously, as a fan, I want more, but I can see they're not like, it ends so good. It's like a bookend, right? So I want more, hopefully, but I can understand if we don't get it. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's a good book, man. When the trade comes out for this soon, go pick it up because it is a very it's a thinker 
Like, it's a thinker, you know? It, it has ambiguous stuff to it. There's some crazy action sequences, drug cartel, crime scene stuff. Really great cool visual symbolism, there. too. Incredible Shout out Sam. Incredible visuals. The art Incredible is great. Art. Yes. Yeah. Incredible art. There's some splash pages in here that are just wow factor. Like, straight, straight, straight wow factor. So... That does it for our books this week. We're going to have to figure out what we're going to do next week. Hmm. Because next week is a little thing called New York Comic Con. And AF and I will be attending. But also next week we have a couple books that we'd love to talk about. Me in particular. There's a little book called Nightwing 118. And that's the finale of it. So maybe we'll, I'll do a special thing just for that so we can at least hold this off for next week. But also, TJ, Ultimate Spider-Man. What else we got? Yes, sir. Uh, go to AF first. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have it. I have it. I just need a second. <laughs> oh, he's... All right. AF, what, what, what... I was going to say, what do you have for next week? But you'll be here in the States. So what are you All looking right. at picking up at Midtown Comics on a new comic book day? So it's probably like the fact that I can actually get it on the day is I think it's I think Lean Lantern is dropping next week. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. and then I think I'm, I want to see how the end of Titans is going to finish. So I'm probably going to pick that up as well. Uh, because yep. I think it's Titans, just two more Titans issues. already. The final issue of Titans of Tom Taylor's run has already come out, but that will be available for you to get. Yeah. The yeah. new run. I think the, that one, yeah, that, that was this week, right? starting soon. Number that was la uh, last week or a week or two ago was Titans. Okay. Okay, cool. TJ, what's yeah. up? I have, like you mentioned, Ultimate Spidey, number 10, Uncanny X-Men, number 4. I've been really loving Gail's take on that. Uh, Wolverine, number 2. I really enjoyed the first issue. Shout out Martin Coccola. Art is so good. So, so good. Uh, and Wonder Woman, 14, a book that I've kind of been a little low on. I got to catch up on the last two issues of it. But I'm well, hoping that now that loot is over yeah. it's getting back on track so I'm still excited yeah. for that the, the event absolutely i don't want to say derailed but that happens with books sometimes that happens with yeah. nightwing when we had a fear state like right at the beginning of that run right after the first arc we went straight into fear state and it was just like oh we're taking left and right turns all over the place before you get mm -hmm. right back on track of things so i'm excited for wonder woman to continue the story that it's been telling absolutely good shout there so go to your local comic shops go read some comics go pick up absolute batman if you haven't done it already because golly what a book until next time